Welcome to our Wednesday evening worship service. Today is October 12th. Our scriptures in the Old Testament this evening, it's in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, beginning with verse 7, reading through verse 14. Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse 7 through 14. Opening hymn this evening is on page 260. What a friend we have in Jesus. Hymn number 260, Nehemiah 4, 7 through 14. Let's begin with a moment of silent meditation and preparation. Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, and we come with hearts of gratitude. This is the day that you have created, and we rejoice and are glad in it. Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts and our thoughts, our minds, our attitudes as we've come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Again, Father, we praise and exalt your holy name, and this is for your honor and for your glory, and we ask it with thanksgiving. Amen. Congregation will please stand as we take our hymnals to turn to page 260. What a friend we have in Jesus. We'll remain standing for the scripture reading and then we'll remain standing for the second hymn. <clears throat> remain standing as we turn in the Holy Bible to Nehemiah chapter 4 beginning with verse 7 through verse 14. All right, good evening. Good evening. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 7. But it came to pass that when Samballot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Amorites and the Ashtonites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stop, uh, stopped, then they were very wroth. And conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. They should not know, neither see, till we come in the midst amongst them and slay them 
and cause the work to see. That was verse 10. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I right. messed up there. That's all right. Verse 11. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass, <coughs> that when the Jews, which dwelt by them, came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and <coughs> rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's remain standing as we turn to hymn number 274, 274, tell it to Jesus. may be seated. Pastor Craig. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody tonight. I had a nice trip over here except for the bridge in Oneida. Uh, there's a, been a one-lane bridge there that they've been working on. You know what I'm talking about? I know. Yeah, and uh, they've been working on that for ever since I've been coming here, I think. And uh, I don't know what the deal is. All you need is put up some concrete and rebar and weld some stuff together and you're all done, right? And uh, so maybe it's a money pit. I I know like there's different places where it seems like it's torn up forever and you wonder what's going on. But anyway, so we all, one, it's a one lane bridge now and a truck ran, ran out of gas right on the bridge. Amen. Why couldn't it be on the other side of the bridge or this side of the bridge? That shows you we have a sin cursed world. Amen. And uh, the king's business requires haste. And J.U. drove his chariot, chariot furiously, but there was no truck on the bridge when he was driving. Uh, so... I didn't know how to get here, 
So uh, a lady said, well, you could turn around, go into Oneida, take Route 5, and go up around to 46. But there's no Route 5 sign that I could see in Oneida. So uh, after a while, you know, you never know if the GPS is betraying you or not, and, or if it's going to loop you right back to where you were. And so I went into Oneida quite a ways, and then I started to start trusting her. And, and uh, sure enough, I was able to reroute around. Uh, but uh, so here, here I am. That's why you leave early, right? And, uh, you know, GPS is not as snotty as it used to be. You remember when it first came out and you made a wrong turn, it would say, recalculating route. It was, a, it was a lady too, and I mean, she was a nasty woman. Recalculating route, like a Catholic nun with a ruler, you know, in a, in a parochial school. And, uh, and boy, I didn't like that at all. And now they're much more pleasant. Uh, I'd sort of like to have a Scottish one. What's the matter with you, man? Are you doff? I told you to turn your buggy around. Uh, that would be cool. So anyway, uh, we made it, and I'm glad we did. There was no doubt some major accident I was going to get into or, you know, some sovereignty God thing that, you know, you got to be careful about being too irritated about things like that, right? Of course, God could have prevented that accident too anyway. All right. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6. I'm going to move along fairly quickly. I have quite a bit of Scripture to go through, and I'll give you the references if you want to jot them down. Uh, you can, uh, but I've written, I've got them all printed out on my notes, so I'm going to kind of go through them quickly because I've got a lot of material I want to cover tonight, and uh, I'm going to speak in the subject of gun control. You know, I, I've come to a place where I don't think there's anything in, a, that in the world you can mention that the Bible doesn't cover one way or another. Brother Craig, nuclear power, Second Peter chapter 3, the elements are going to dissolve with the fervent heat. You know, so I don't think there's anything the Bible doesn't cover. And certainly gun control is uh, one of those things that it does. I had, when I had a lady challenge me in my church. She was, she was going nuts you know, with a, a cult at the time. And I was getting ready to church discipline her for heresy, and, and uh, she moved away. So I said, well, okay, that's, that's great. So I don't have to deal with that. Uh, but she said, uh, you know, protecting yourself and, and guns and all that, that's not in the Bible. So I wrote a paper, gave it to her, and I think I turned her around on that issue. Uh, but, so if you challenge me at something, I'll probably get a paper written, okay? So just so you know, I've never preached this as far as I know. I just had the notes, and so I did some work on it this week and uh, wanted to get it to you. So I called Tom Stiles. I said, Tom, you want to, you know, he does those bro uh, brochure type things. I said, do you want to, uh, some notes on gun control? He said, you know what? I was thinking about writing one in that, so I'm going to send him my notes. But I have to, I don't know why I get myself into this. Now I have to make them legible. Okay, and, and somewhat sane uh, for Tom. So anyway, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 6. It, it, maybe this would be better entitled Biblical Self-Defense. Biblical Self-Defense. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now the context uh, here is the murmuring children of Israel. And, uh, and uh, Paul points out how God saved them in spite of their murmuring across the Dead Sea or the Red Sea to the other side, and they were safe. Let's ask God's blessing on our time. Father, I pray that you bless our study night. Might the Spirit of God use your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So they crossed the Red Sea, and, and then uh, Paul gives us an illustration or, or an example saying that the Old Testament accounts were for our examples. So we can learn different spiritual truths. Here it was not to lust after evil things, but we can learn spiritual truths from the accounts in the Old Testament. I don't like to call them stories. A story may or may not be true. An account should be true. And the Old Testament is a true account of things that actually happen. So should a believer have the right to defend himself uh, with, with, in, in a lethal way? Baptists traditionally, and, and uh, I think, Throughout our history, uh, we've had a great history of being pacifists. Uh, we got over that, amen? Uh, we got over that. Uh, but I think a lot of Baptists had a pacifistic history. The Mennonites, for instance, still do. There were groups that were not pacifistic, and that was one group was the Huguenots. Uh, the Huguenots, actually the Roman Catholics tried to murder them all. The Huguenots were evangelical, and maybe they were Baptistic. Uh, individuals, uh, they were numbered in the tens of thousands, mainly in France and Western Europe and other places. 
And uh, they were constantly defending themselves against the Jesuits or the Catholics who would try to, to murder them all. And so the king, I think it was Charles II, or he was Charles I of France. Anyway, he was Catholic. Uh, and in his, uh, in his castle there was a relative, uh, Henry of Navarre, it was, he was called, who was of royal blood, but he was a Protestant. And so because he was of royal blood, they didn't kill him, but he documented a lot of the things that were going on. And uh, I, read, I was at a rummage sale at a Methodist church, I think it was. might have been Presbyterian. Anyway, they had a lot of rummage. Uh, but I've always been a bookworm. And I bought this book called Henry of Navarre. Very, very slow read. Really tough. But once I start a book, I'm going to finish it no matter what. So I, I waded through that book, names and places and dates you never heard of. You know, people, you know, the history's basically forgotten about, I think. But I've, I, I wrestled my way through that book, learned a couple of interesting things. In the, uh, in the castle, there was an heir to the throne born, and they had this uh, old mother that was taking care of the baby, and she was afraid the baby would die of the chills. Being just, it's, it's summertime. It's 90 degrees. She's got a fire going in the fireplace, wrapping the child up, it's, and... And finally, the child died of just being overheated, you know, but she was trying to protect it. Prior to that, they had two people that was watching the baby, and they had it all wrapped up, and they'd throw it in and out the window like a football, you know. It's an interesting book. And so, uh, at any rate, they decided to have peace with the, with the Huguenots, and they invited them into Paris. And remember, they, they said to the Huguenots, we want to have a treaty, we want to have peace, we want the wars to be over. And we want to get along. Catholics should be able to get along with Huguenots. So they invited him into the city of Paris. Did I tell you this story before? They invited him into the city of Paris. They closed the city gates. They had to give up their weapons because it was supposed to be peaceful. They gave up their weapons. They brought him into the city gates, uh, into the city of Paris, locked the gates, and murdered them all, thousands of them, in the streets of Paris. Now, there's more to this story. Uh, after they murdered them all, uh, the king and, and the people in the palace that night heard screamings of revolution in the streets. The palace guards ran out in the streets, and the streets were quiet. That happened night after night after night as the demons rejoiced in the murder, murder I think, uh, in the murder of the Huguenots. And then the birds of prey started circling the tower where the king slept. And, uh, and then he succumbed to the plague, he would wake up in the morning and in the middle of the night with his bed soaked in his own blood as he was dying uh, in his bedchamber. And before he died, he said, I thank God that I don't have an heir to pass on the curse that has come upon me for the murder of the Huguenots. That's quite a story, you know. That was worth the read. That was worth all the sacrifice wade through that, that book uh, to learn that. The Huguenots gave up their weapons, and they were slaughtered by the Catholics in the city of of Paris. I started carrying a gun when I was a very small child. I believe at age of 12, you can uh, hunt in, in Pennsylvania with a parent. Of course, I lived out in the middle of sticks. We didn't have a bathroom in our house. We didn't have running water. Uh, we had, had no insulation, two coal stoves, one in a living room, one in a kitchen. That's how we heated it. The stove was a lying stove. It said right on the, on the top of the stove, warm morning heater. There was never one morning it was ever warm except for the summertime. We break the ice in the basin, the wash in the kitchen. That's, that's the way it was. So we lived in the woods. 12 years of age, I was out hunting squirrels and rabbits and never thought anything of it. And so I've carried a gun almost from the, from the beginning of, of my time, you know, and, and just thought nothing of it ever being anything but a weapon. Now, I'll say this one time. My brother, when he was 16, he got a phone call. You've been sleeping with my wife, and I'm going to kill you. Not my brother, believe me. I mean, he was, like, pretty old before he even started dating. He was so shy, you know, and it was, like, ridiculous. And so he sat out in the front porch all day with a 30-30 across his lap, you know. I'm going to, take, I'm going to defend myself. And then uh, I think the guy had the wrong number, probably. He's probably drunk. And so uh, that's kind of, kind of my background with this. Um, when I came to New York, I had an NRA card when I was a kid. I took the NRA self-defense, or not self-defense, but gun safety program, and they accepted that when I got a hunting license in New York, which, which shocked me to death. So I go way back with guns, and not, not that I'm a great hunter or, or a great marksman, but I've always enjoyed them, and I've been good enough with it uh, to uh, defend things. 
And so the, the law of God is based, the law, our laws today are based on the laws of Moses. And uh, they come from the Old Testament. And so we can look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about this business of self-defense and, uh, and using lethal means to protect ourselves. In 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, it says, Doth not even nature itself teach you? And I'll just read the rest of the verse. That if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. So there is such a thing as nature's law. Nature's law. You realize the entire revolution of the United States was fought on the basis of natural law or nation's law. I, I copied out some of the beginnings of the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal, and equal station to which the laws of nature, the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. What was the basis of the Declaration of Independence? It was nature's law. If you take a rat, and if a rat came in here tonight and, uh, and uh, it saw you, it would probably run, unless you're in the subways of New York City or something, but normally they would run, right? You corner them and that rat will defend itself. It'll try to fight you, try to bite you and whatever it can do to get away. That's nature's law. God has put a desire for self-preservation and self-defense in each and every one of us. That's nature's law. And so even our nation was based on nature's law. Now, Exodus chapter 22, we see the first mention basically of, of, of uh, self-defense. It says in Exodus 22, 2, if a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. So a man comes into your home, that's at night, and we're going to clarify that now, but at nighttime, he comes in, he's, you know, he's breaking and entering. Uh, you can, according to the Word of God, you have every right to protect yourself and your home and your family, and there's no guilt. There's, you don't have to shed your blood for that individual. Verse 3 says this, If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution if he have nothing then he shall be sold for his theft. So daytime, <clears throat> the guy's breaking in the daytime, uh, there's people around, uh, there are you know, other means of defending yourself besides shooting the guy. You know, it's like the police today. It wasn't always this way, but if a thief is running away from them, they can't shoot him in the back. Halt, stop, like the old movies they did, but today they don't. Uh, and they have other means of trying to capture the individual. So that is really scriptural. I mean, if, if, if you don't have to kill a guy, you don't kill a guy, okay? But if you're defending your life, you have every right by nature's law and the law of Moses to defend yourself and protect yourself. And so that's based on the, the Word of God. Um, and these things were our examples that we see in the New Testament. We'll get to the New Testament here in a minute. But these things in the Old Testament are examples. The law of first mention lays down the idea of self-protection or self of preservation. Um, I had a little note here. I can't read my own note. Uh, it doesn't matter. Nehemiah chapter 4, and uh, we'll look at verses basically 8 through 23, that section. Uh, I want you to realize that the folks of Nehemiah's day uh, were not soldiers. Uh, they were civilians that were building a wall around, uh, around, around uh, their city in order to be protected from those who would try to kill them and destroy them. They were not soldiers, citizens protecting their property, uh, defending against hate crimes. Sam Ballad and his crew hated the Jews. They didn't want the Jews to prosper or have their own city or their own defense, and so uh, they were building a wall to protect themselves. Now, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, it says, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren. Fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your houses. Five things that you are allowed to protect. Yourself, obviously, your brethren, your friends, neighbors, your brethren, your children, your wives, and your property. 
five things laid out, Nehemiah laid out, that the, the, uh, that the, that the believer had a right to protect uh, in the book of Nehemiah. Verse 15, it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And so what happened? When they were able to defend themselves in verse 14, it deterred crime. It deterred the enemy from trying to destroy them, at least for a while. And so the fact that they were to defend themselves, it was a deterrent. You know Switzerland? Uh, about every other person in Switzerland owns a gun. Now, to own a gun in Switzerland, you have to take a, a gun safety program and a, and a shooting skills program. I have no problem with that. I did that when I was a, in an NRA club when I was a kid. And, uh, but I don't think the government ought to do it. Uh, it may be like Christian schools, substantially equivalent. Why? Because the government gets way carried away. You heard about this buyback program. You know, if you have a gun, you can take it and they'll buy it back and nothing, no questions asked. This guy had a 3D printer. He printed a whole bunch of, whole bunch of pistols, took them in and made $21,000. I think that's a great idea. Where can I get a 3D printer, right? Uh, anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But verse, the fact that they defended themselves in verse 14 was a deterrent to their uh, unsafety in verse 15. It's unsafety a word, I don't know. Verse 16. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears and the shields and the bows and the harbingers, that's the coat of mail, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. Verse 17, and they which built on the wall, and uh, they that bear the burden, and those that laid every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon held a weapon. And so the, the weapon was a deterrent to evil. The book of ha Esther, you, you're all familiar with uh, uh, Queen Esther and the story of Esther. If you're not, you need to get down to Sight and Sounds and see it the next time it's, it's down there. Uh, or you could read the Bible, too. There's an idea. You know, um, I think it was, it was Ben Franklin uh, was our ambassador to, Paris, to France, you know, years ago, a long time ago. And they were all existentialists. They were mainly atheists or deists and all that. <clears throat> Didn't believe the Bible. The Bible was just a joke to them. And so Ben Franklin said, I have found an ancient manuscript, an ancient manuscript. And I'm going to have a big party, and we're going to, I'm going to read this ancient, the, the beauty of the poetry and the language and all that is just breathtaking. I'm going to read this ancient manuscript. God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. And so he read this ancient manuscript, at the book of Esther, and they said, oh, that's wonderful, that's wonderful, that's great, that's beautiful, this and that. Where did you find it? In the Bible, <laughs> in the Bible. That took a little air out of their balloon. Uh, but the book of Esther is an, is an amazing book, and uh, verse number 11 of Esther chapter 8, and we, we know the story of Esther, the uh, Queen Esther became the uh, queen, it took place in Persia, Iran, by the way, in Iran. So she became the queen. Uh, she was really a good-looking gal, and the king was just enamored with her and made her the, king, the queen. And, uh, and uh, Haman uh, wanted everybody to worship him, basically, and bow to him. And, and so uh, when Mordecai, a Jew, wouldn't do that, because uh, that's, that's uh, worshiping a, a false god, in a sense, uh, he wouldn't bow. And so Haman got all bent out of shape, made a decree, hey, let's kill all the Jews. That would be a good thing to do. He's a picture of the Antichrist, by the way. And uh, so he built this gallows. And then uh, one night the king uh, couldn't sleep, so he was reading the congressional record. Nothing will make you sleep faster than reading the congressional record. This time of the year, people get all this stuff from Medicare. I tell them, if you can't read, just, if you can't sleep, just read all that. Otherwise, heat your house with it and give me a call. I'll help you out. So that's what I do all day is learn all that junk. So uh, he's, he couldn't sleep. He's reading the congressional record. And he sees where this guy saved him from two assassins. What's his name? Mordecai. What have we done for him? <laughs> and to make a longer story shorter, uh, Haman got hung on Mordecai's gallows. Now, what happened? The king's orders could not be reversed. Yeah, let's kill all the Jews. Can't reverse it. So what he did was, he said, let's allow the Jews to defend themselves. And what happened? When the Jews were able to defend themselves, it took care of all the problems of, uh, of the uh, uh, Persians trying to kill them. 
So self-defense deterred the annihilation of the Jewish nation. Verse 11, when the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, they could defend their lives, to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish all the power of the people and providence that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. And now, so this, there was restitution. So if people were trying to kill you and you defended yourself, they had to pay restitution through the spoils. I'll say more about that later. Upon one day in all the province of King Azarus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is in the month Adar, Verse, chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, and the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near, he be put to execution in that day, that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. See, because they were able to defend themselves. Verse 2, the Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the providence of the king Azarus, to lay hand on such as sought their hurt, and no man could have withstood them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. You know, the rabbis were telling the Jews prior to their annihilation in Germany that, that, that don't defend yourself, don't defend yourself, and you see how that worked out. Verse 3, And all the rulers and providences, and the lieutenants, and the deputies, and the officers of the king helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. And Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, waxed great and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. So self-defense, clearly taught in the Bible. Now here we see a legal sanction to defend yourself. God did not punish them for defending themselves. It was God's blessing to allow self defense, that's nature's law. And so they were, they were nonviolent. They didn't want to do it, but they had to defend themselves. Verse 11, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life. Uh, you know what? You have the, I think you, have, you should have the right to stand for your life in the New York City subways. See? And, and uh, that's taken away. So what's happening? People are being murdered every day. We went to a Broadway musical uh, years ago. We took the Amtrak to New York City, stayed in the Comfort Inn, went to a Broadway play. I forget what it was. <laughs> it didn't really impress me that much. Sight and Sounds is better, by the way. Anyway, and, and came, we, we had very little fear when Giuliani was running the show. But now, there's no way I'd go to New York City. I mean, if Pete Mentoro asked me to preach, I might. But I wouldn't really want to. So that's just that's the way it is. When people can defend themselves, there's, there's peace. They were allowed to protect their lives, their loved ones, and their property. New York, you're not allowed to even protect your property, I don't think. Number two, now let's look at the New Testament. Uh, right after the communion, the first communion service, and the institution instituting of the Lord's Supper, on their way to prayer meeting, Luke chapter 22 and verse 35. Now, I'll say this, when I was a kid, I went to one-room schoolhouse. There again, no running water, no indoor bathrooms. Uh, there was three, ro three rooms. The, the classroom where he had four grades, it was in the Becca system before the Hortons knew about that. And then there was two cloak rooms, one for the boys and one for the girls. And by the way, we knew the difference between a boy and a girl. Highly educated at that time. So, I mean, even a Supreme Court justice doesn't know that. And we knew that in first grade. So, uh, went, just you know, went to one-room schoolhouse, and I learned there that the pilgrims, when they came to this continent, would bring their muskets and to church, and they would, because they're afraid of Indian attacks, and they would stack them in the back corner of the church so that if they needed to defend themselves in worship, they could do that. Now, our country, that's the way it was founded. Now, in Luke 22, 35, they, we see the Lord's Supper. They're, they've had that. They're going to Gethsemane for a prayer meeting. Verse 35 of Luke 22, and he said unto them, When I sent you without purse, grip, shoes, lacked ye anything, and they said nothing. So Jesus said, I sent you out soul winning. Did you need a sword? No. Did you need a purse? Need a script? No. Now there's going to be change. Now we're coming in now to persecution time. Verse 36, then said he unto them, But now, but now. See, that's a change. 
He that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise a script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Why? Now we're going to go to the Gentiles. Gentiles hate the Jews. Jews hate the Gentiles. There's going to be a difference in the whole program. I used to never carry a gun out so many I do now. You know, I got too big of a mouth for a small man. <laughs> okay, so I was out knocking doors in a, it was kind of like a ghetto apartment place. And this guy just kept screaming at me. I mean, just screaming. So I turned on him and I said, as loud as I could, as loud as he, as he said, are you off your meds? Quiet. I mean, that was it. Absolutely quiet. And, uh, but lots of times I'll carry a pistol now because, you know, I believe in self-defense. But, and I've done things like that before, which I really shouldn't have done, okay, looking back on it. So, but now he says, sell your garment, buy a sword. Verse 37, for I say unto you that this, that this that is written must be accomplished in me, and he that reckoned among the transgressors for the thing concerning me have an end. Verse 38, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Now, Jesus didn't change his mind. And he said, here's two swords. Jesus said, okay, that'll, that'll do it. That's a ratio of one to six, by, by the way. See, how many people carry a gun to church? Well, ratio of one to six wouldn't be bad. Verse 39, and he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed. Now, number one, Jesus expected them to have swords and anticipated a time when those without swords would need to acquire one. That's pretty plain. Number two, they did have two swords. Number three, Jesus expected them to have a sword as they traveled from city to city, uh, at, even including their prayer meeting. Now, that's pretty plain. Now, we, we say, well, Jesus told them to sheathe the sword. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Verse 49, Luke 22. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Next, say, what did Jesus do? Well, and Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now notice what Jesus said, Suffer uh, ye thus far. In other words, Jesus was saying, Hold it. Okay? He took the severed ear. You say, Why did Peter? You know, Peter meant business. I mean, he did. He didn't, he didn't go. He just came right down. He's going to split that guy's head right open. But his sights were off. His sights were off a little bit to the right, you know. And it must have been a sharp sword to cut a guy's ear clean off. I mean, ear's gone. Uh, and, and so Jesus said, hang on. He picked up the ear, put the ear back on, healed the guy. And when do you think they'd say, you know what? I don't think we need to be crucifying a, you know, a healer like this, but that's what they did. Uh, so, but what, what did it do? It slowed down the process. See, it slowed down the process so Jesus could say the things he needed to say. Jesus answered and said, Suffer you thus far. Verse 52, Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, But ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour and power of, this your hour of, power of darkness. Jesus did not want the disciples to get carried away with swords because they were really outnumbered. And Jesus didn't come to fight or set up the kingdom. He came on the cross. And so, he, you know, if the disciples had, had, uh, had really had swords out and went to battle, they had all been crucified. That wasn't God's plan, okay? And that wasn't what God wanted to do. But Jesus did want them to be able to defend themselves going forward. Mark, uh, or Matthew 26, 51. And behold, one of them which was with Jesus stretched his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword in the place, for all they that take the sword shall perish uh, with the sword. Now, they couldn't win, as I said. Um, remember the movie sh that movie uh, theater shooting? The guy was way in the front of the movie theater, and he had on a bulletproof helmet, bulletproof cloth clothing. Uh, he had on a, a rapid-fire weapon. I don't remember what it was. And my wife said, well, if you were there and you, you carried, you could, you could have taken care of that. I said, no, there's no way. There's no way. I mean, first of all, it's, uh, the distance is too great for a little stub nose. Okay, secondly, he had armor on. 
And, you know, you've got to pick your battles, folks, you know. And that's, I think that's what Jesus was saying here. And, and it's not God's will for you to fight. It's God's will for me to go to the cross. And so he wasn't saying never defend yourself. He was saying, in this case, this is not the program. Verse uh, 54, but now, but how then shall the scripture be fulfilled? In other words, if, if we were to fight, and Jesus said I could call 10,000 know, legions of angels, but that's not my program. But when Jesus comes back, he comes back with a sword in his mouth, and he destroys the enemies. And we come back with him, and we with him destroy the enemies in the battle of Armageddon. And so it's, it's kind of like, uh, better is a live dog than a dead lion. Okay, I think that would be appropriate. Now we can overpower, uh, we can overpower them, but I am not resisting, so I can go to the cross. John 18:10. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant' name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword in the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Jesus wasn't against self-defense. He was against not. He was against missing the will of God uh, and dying on a cross. So Jesus is saying we have the right to self-defense, but we are putting it aside for a greater purpose. Now, why did Jesus tell Peter to put up his sword? Jesus had better means of self-defense. He said, I could call legions of angels. And those who are violent will die violently. We don't, we don't carry a gun or whatever to be violent. That's not our purpose. We should never, ever desire to be violent. It's a matter of taking care of our family, our, our uh, property, and our personal lives. God hates those who are violent. Psalm 11:5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. We should be peaceful. We should be a peaceful people. And uh, we should try to get along as best we can. That's God's will. So the sword is not the appropriate response in persecution. When we're being persecuted, as Jesus was, as the disciples was, he said, put up your sword. Put up your sword. And so we need to show love, not, not uh, necessarily defense. Thirdly, the possession of a weapon is never discouraged in the Bible. First Samuel, I'm going to have to do this quickly, I guess, because we're running out of time. First Samuel 13 uh, through 21, it says this. Now, there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. Uh, for the Philistines, says, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. So the Philistines, under Saul's rule, uh, demanded gun control in Israel so that they could not defend themselves. The only ones that had swords or spears was King Saul and his family. That's why David had to go to the priest and get Goliath's sword. There were no swords in Israel. So they could not defend themselves against the attack of the enemy. 2 Kings 24, 14 and, uh, and following, uh, we see the same thing. The Philistines did this. The Babylonians did this. When, uh, under Nehemiah, when they came out of captivity, they didn't, they, didn't have, they, they didn't have swords, at least to begin with. Let's look at that real quickly. 2 Kings 24. 2 Kings 24 and verse number 14. Fourteen, And that, that was Gideon's problem, too, too by the way. They, they didn't have smiths to make swords. It says, And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men. This is uh, Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian captivity. And, and uh, the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and the smiths. The smiths. Uh, go down to verse number 16, same way. Craftsmen and the smiths. Why? Because the smiths would make swords. And so they controlled the population by taking away their only means of self-defense. That's what's happening in America tonight. Um, okay, number four. Ultimately, they were, not, they were not trusting the sword, but trusting the Lord. Psalm 144, verses one, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord that teacheth my fingers to fight and my hand to make war. And so it's, it's God. Look, our trust is not in our nuclear arsenal. It's not in our military it's in our God, and what's really scary is we've kicked God out of just about everything in our society. Psalm 44, verse 6, For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. 
but thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hate us. That's just like saying, you know, Lord, help me shoot straight. <laughs> and uh, that's gun control. That's ultimate gun control. But he uses the bow and the sword. And uh, Nehemiah 4.14, fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, and your wives. And then uh, Nehemiah 4.20, our God shall fight for us. You see, there's a, there's a, God's going to be the one that protects us, but we can defend ourselves. It's like the farmer. He bought an old broken down farm, buildings and the whole works. And he worked day and night for a couple of years and made it a very beautiful farm. One guy said, wow, wow, look what God has done with this farm. He said, he said you should have seen it when just God had it. Amen. So the point being that, yes, we, uh, we have that right to take care of ourselves. And, yes, we trust the Lord. And we, we see, seek Him to pr protect us. But the fact of the matter is, there's something we've got to do ourselves in order to protect ourselves. First um, Samuel 17, 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth, not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. The Battle of Sackett Harbor, if you ever go up there, read the plaque. The 1812, War of 1812, the British were just shelling from a ship, shelling uh, the city of Sackett's Harbor. And we were out of ball for our cannons. And the British ball was smaller than the caliber for our cannons. So we couldn't take their ball and shoot it back to them. And so what they did was they ran into the church. They tore up the carpet. They took the, the, the British ball, cannonball, wrapped it in the carpet, stuffed it in the cannon, fired it, and when they fired it, the ball went out, the carpet went every which way, and the British were standing on board their ship laughing their heads off until that ball went right down and landed on their deck and sunk their ship. Now, was that God or was that the cannon? That was God. But God used the cannon. See? That's what I'm trying to say. And so, back to the New Testament, Mark almost done. Mark 3.27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoils goods, property, except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. How do you bind a strong man? Well, the strong man evidently didn't have something to make him stronger than the guy that broke into his house. So I think that the Bible is pretty clear. Absolute right to self-defense. And it's a terrible thing to see a government who was founded in nature's law Take that away from us. That's powerful prayer. Father, we thank you for the study tonight. I pray that you'd help us to pray for our nation, that we come back to you and back to biblical principles. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One other thing real quick. That next verse in Exodus, it talks about the breaking in during the day. The man was captured, and then he'd have to do restitution. And so you didn't you know, kill a guy running away, but... If he was breaking in, he was sold uh, to work for restitution. I've had two people court-ordered to me, and they did restitution, believe me. Let me give you some announcements. <clears throat> We're kind of doing this backwards tonight, but that's okay. Let me give you some routine announcements, and then I'll give you a special announcement that was just handed me. Uh, just an update. We are currently working at getting a, John and New, a new John and Romans project. Uh, we don't have a date yet, but we will keep you informed. Scott and Sandy... Uh, will be letting us know when he has a project ready. Uh, as of right now, we don't have any work available for pickup. So uh, if you're involved in that ministry, that's kind of an update. October 14th, the Patch Fall Harvest Party is from 4 to 7 p.m. at Teal Farm. Uh, the address can be found in the foyer. The farm has a corn maze, wagon rides, corn pit, and pumpkins for sale. Patch is paying for the use of the venue and for each child to have a small pumpkin. We are allowed to bring food in. We will have a walking taco for the main food. Please sign up on the sheet in the foyer next to the requested 
item. If you have not signed up, there's about four items that we're, uh, they're still needing, and that is, you know, the day after tomorrow. So if that's something you can help with, appreciate it. October 15th at 10 o'clock, October 19th at 10 o'clock uh, is cantata practice. So uh, that's ongoing until near Christmas. November 27th at 11 o'clock, we'll be having a Thanksgiving service. Uh, you'll be getting more information on that. Uh, it will be done very similar to what we did when the missionary conference was here. We'll have a service, uh, a Sunday school morning service, a group uh, fellowship meal, and then the afternoon service will be uh, at 2 o'clock or 2.30. But you'll be getting a lot more information in the coming weeks, and that's on November 27th. Rahab Refuge Ministry is excited to announce our first annual trees coming to the Caleb Civil Center in Oneida, New York on November 17th, 18th from 6 to 9, and on November 19th from 4 to 9. Event proceeds will be going to our House of Hope residential program. Come visit the Festival of Trees event for some good old-fashioned family fun. Stroll through our Christmas wonderland of beautiful the decorated trees while sipping hot chocolate and enjoying some Christmas music. We'll also have free face painting for the children, children's crafts, numerous vendors, a nativity photo op, a gospel booth, food concession stands, raffle tickets to win Christmas trees, raffle tickets to win gift baskets in 50-50. The Light of the World Ballet performance will be on Saturday, 11 19 at 7.30 in the evening. Uh, tickets at the door are $5 each. Kids four and under are free. Volunteers are needed for this uh, event, especially for the gospel booth. Please sign up, see the bulletin board, or for questions, ask Mrs. Carpenter. Uh, so that's something to look forward to. Christmas is right around the corner here. If I could have a couple of ushers, Eric and Mark. Mark? Certainly, Father, we thank you for the sisters of Western for this evening and thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the opportunity to give to the Redwood Church and we bless those who give to the Redwood Church in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> have your prayer sheets, let me direct you to column C, illness, and update you on a couple of things there. Uh, Pat Carnicelli, as you know or may not know, is in memory care at a facility in Clinton. Uh, she fell and she fractured her right humerus, which is the large upper arm bone. Uh, she's in a sling. 
Uh, she will be followed up with an orthopedic surgeon in about two or three weeks. Uh, she's doing reasonably well overall. If you want more information, feel free to ask me. The other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is item number six on the illness, uh, Jessica Wise's friend, and we have an update on her and a praise. She's in her 40s, roughly. Uh, Kristen Armstrong's doctors were able to remove the total cancer, uh, and there seems to be no residual uh, appearance of it, so that's a real prayer answer. She's been on our list for a little while, but continue to, to pray for her as she recovers and uh, keep Mrs. Carnicelli in your prayers. Do you have any prayer requests on my right? Any prayer requests in the middle? Any prayer requests on my left? I'm sorry. Keep Josh and Annie in your prayers. Their wedding is on Saturday of this week. Because of the hour, I'm going to uh, postpone our missionary letters until next week.